Hey class, just wanted to remind you to be reading your book. We are pretty far along in it now, and the reading schedule is on in the syllabus on the course calendar. I just wanted to remind you that we've been reading every chapter we've been covering in the lectures, and you should be done with Egypt. And we're on to the start of... The Prehistoric Aegean. So you should be up to here in your book by now. And um, this will be the next section we'll be covering. The next test will be on Chapter 4 and 5, which is Ancient Greece, which is all part of the same geographic region of the world. So you'll want to be reading Chapter 4 and then go on to Chapter 5. And that will be the next chapter that will be... Um, taking tests on chapter four and five next chapters I should say so get going on that and stay abreast of all the information on that course calendar I've been talking to you guys about it in the lectures just wanted to make sure you remembered to do that and we're gonna get started with the video slide lecture and also there's a cool documentary I posted in the chapter four module about ancient Greece and some of the treasure they found it's really interesting. It's from the BBC. Um, I really like how it shows the detail of the different cities and the like places that we're talking about. And he introduces some really cool ideas about um, how the mythology of ancient Greece kind of actually is tied to history. And you could think of it maybe like the historical reality of something like Johnny Appleseed. There was a guy named John Chapman who planted apple trees on the East Coast, but he became kind of a mythological fellow. So that's the kind of idea that they're going to start tying in, and we'll talk more about that, and I'll have some slides about that. But check out that documentary. Um, you can watch it before or after the video lecture. I think um, I have a point in the slide lecture where I say stop and watch it now if you want, but it's kind of up to you. Just make sure you're engaging at all because, as I said before in the syllabus and many a time, the tests are on the lectures, of course, and also the readings. So you want to make sure you're engaging with all the materials and they supplement each other. I don't just want to cover the exact line by line of the book. I want to expand upon it and give you kind of additional information and thoughts so it kind of makes sense about the worldview and add in some, you know, visual things that show you the places we're talking about, like the videos and stuff that I'll be posting. Because of the nature of Canvas and all that, sometimes I have to actually do it in a way that's not as clean as it would be in person, but I still think it works, is where you pause one and then go to the page and watch, and it kind of go back and forth a tiny bit. Because of the nature of, like, the copyrights, um, everything I use is totally fine for me to use. It's I'm not breaking copyright. But I can't exactly embed it all the time in the lecture, so that's not as clean as I'd like, but I still think it's worth just stopping and going and checking those out. Because those videos really give you a sense of place, especially when we get into Mycenaean culture. There's some really interesting things from Khan Academy that show you the views of the city. and makes more sense what we're talking about when you look at it, okay? So let's start on the Prehistoric Aegean, Chapter 4. All right, class, so this is the slide lecture for The Age of Heroes is my subtitle. Like the documentary I talked about, it is not Chapter 6, so let me see what's going on there. A little error. It is actually Chapter 4, The Prehistoric Aegean. So let's get started looking at some of the area that we'll be talking about geographically. We're also going to be talking about this area and three distinct cultures. They're on the islands in the Aegean Sea, and some of it, one of the cultures, Mycenae, is on the mainland of Greece as well. So we're going to be talking about the Cycladic, the Minoan, and the Mycenaean culture. But let me point out to you where they are. Cycladic is going to be mostly here on this grouping of islands. The Minoan culture will be primarily around Crete, and we'll look at one site in Terra. And then the Mycenaean culture is going to be on the Peloponnesian Peninsula over in this area. Mycenae is their main site. 
it's talked about as the prehistoric Aegean because all of the, these islands and mainland are around the Aegean Sea. I'll tell you a bit at the beginning about a documentary that I want you to watch from Treasures of Ancient Greece. And I kind of explained a little bit about why I have the subtitle Age of Heroes on this doc on this chapter. But let's talk a little bit about Homer and who he was. This is a portrait of him, a sculpture that is pretty idealized, but we could say he looks like a particular person and he was a particular person um, in the past who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. In these books, they have larger than life heroes in their mythology. And he talks a lot about a golden age, um, a heroic age. And like I was saying about this sort of the relationship between him and this golden age would be similar to like us and Johnny Appleseed. Well, you could also think about like King Arthur and the round table as compared to modern day England. Okay. The real myth that is based on something that was probably true in certain ways. Um, archaeologists have found some remains from a heroic age and mostly the works have been discovered since 1870. Before that, they were only really known him as this myth and legend. Um, so we're going to be kind of unpacking the idea of what is the historical pre hygiene versus this sort of mythology that was developed to explain their worldview in ancient Greece, the next chapter. They use these mythologies to talk about the nature of reality and what they believed. Um, and so there's kind of a looking at the, the both end. What is sort of the sites where they may be based off of and then talking a little bit about in the next chapter how they viewed themselves because of this. So it's tied together in that way. Civilization we're going to be talking about, the first one is the Cycladic Civilization named after this grouping of islands here in the Aegean. They are a culture that had sailors, fishermen, and a lot of trade as their island economy. They also were hunters and farmers to some extent, but they don't have as much land as, say, the ancient Near East. But they were permanently settled here in this area. Um, they were not nomadic. But there isn't a writing system that we have for them. So this is getting back to some of the problems we discovered in the, you know, the really ancient Paleolithic, Neolithic times, where we don't have their record of what they thought about their life and their culture and their way of belief, of worshiping and their beliefs. So we're doing a lot of guesswork using archaeology and looking at the nature of objects and art objects to try to understand them from the, their own clues, the clues within the work, basically. And so the earliest pieces from this age, from this culture, are Bronze Age, okay? So we're looking at quite a long time ago. This civilization is about 3000 BC to 1100 BC. So that's a really long 3000 BC to, forgive the bad writing, sorry, 1100 BC. I want you guys to see it though. I'm going to have to work on that. This is, this is the range. So we're talking about a pretty long, long time here, 1900 years or so. That's, that's a long period of history. If you think about it in terms of like our nation, how long we've been around, we're not even, not even close to that yet. So we're talking about a really long period of time and we don't know a lot about them because there's not a written record. So this is a survey course. We can do what we can do in, in the amount of time we have in the chapter, but you could spend quite a long time talking about any one of these civilizations and write whole books about them. There are books written about them, okay? So we're just going to try to do our best to unpack some of the, the art and look at sort of where they're coming from and build into 
the way that they set the groundwork for ancient Greece, which is a really important chapter for us coming up, chapter 5, because a lot of the things after that are based off of ancient Greece. But before we get any deeper into the Cycladic culture, I want to talk about some of the goals we have for this chapter. Um, we want to be able to identify the geographic area known as the Aegean, which we already did. And we're going to be with Cycladic culture discussing visual aspects and context of the sculptures. And then as we go through, we're going to be looking at the Minoan culture and talking about their society and their visual aspects of their art. And then that is going to link us into the last culture we're going to be talking about is the Mycenaean culture. And we're going to look at the link between Minoan and Mycenaean cultures, but also between um, the way in which their architectural achievements end up kind of in a certain way influencing ancient Greece and discussing the relationship between Minoan and Mycenaean cultures as well. Um, so a lot of the architecture we look at in Mycenae is pretty amazing and it's pretty influential with the domes and things later on. We'll talk about in different chapters how they influence other people. So when we point that out, I just want you to understand it so that it'll help you with future chapters in the course. All right, so let's continue on with the Cycladic culture. We're going to look at especially a certain type of art object there's a number of them. It's not just one of them. They found quite a few of them. They are called Cycladic Idols. This is an example of one here. And there's not exactly a clear idea of what their function was. You can see the size of it in relationship to a person here. And then there's other ones that have been found that are much smaller in scale. This is the one from your book that you'll see in your book that you'll be able to you need to be able to identify as well as this one what was the function worship funerary rituals was it a fertility goddess we're not exactly sure but there is some idea that it must have been used in a processional because none of them can stand see how they're all on little stands right here none of them are able to be to stand in their own right and if you look at them from the side, the feet are pointed downward and the body sort of zigzags. So what were they used for? We think processional because of that. And that's especially, like I said, due to the angle of the feet. The other thing that's interesting about them is, and this is why we think they may have a funerary or burial function, is they were found in graves. Why were they there? We're not exactly sure. But there's an idea possibly of accompanying the dead to the afterlife. Probably important people were buried with them. Um, and they were laying down. So they can't stand on their own feet. It doesn't matter if they're laying down inside of graves. Why the different scales? Well, maybe the importance of the people. Maybe the availability of material. That's not exactly, sh exactly clear. But they range in size from 5 feet down to a few inches. They are out of marble and they are carved in the round as you could see. Um, that's a question we're going to ask in a second. I'm just trying to show you a slide from the size of, side of them. They're carved all the way around. Okay, There's a much larger number of female figures and some of them have traces of paint in different spots where they possibly had eyes and a mouth that were painted on and dots on their cheeks so there would have been possibly like there was most likely some type of idea of the face painted on and dots on the cheeks so that would have added a whole nother element it wasn't carved but it was pictorially added to the sculpture so that's interesting because it gives us an idea that they were concerned somewhat with them being um, recognizable as human faces, right? More than just a blank face. They're very geometric in nature. They have a pyramid type of nose, and some of them have a bit of a mouth showing. But they're very abstract and simplified. And this gets us into this question about... What are the visual aspects of them, and why are the figures popular and highly collectible now? 
Well, in a lot of ways, they're very much like modern art. They're very, they're very similar in certain ways. If you can think of modern contemporary sculpture, that's very abstract. And so there's, they're very desirable because even though they're really old, they fit into that sort of aesthetic that's highly valued these days. Um, and there's a lot of fakes because of that. They're, they've been faked quite a bit because people want to make money off of faking art. It's something that still happens. Forgeries are still found in the world. Um, they're very elongated, and their bodies are very kind of thin. Where's the picture here? It is. They're very elongated and very thin. They don't have a lot of um, width to them or depth to them. They're back is basically flat for the buttocks and the bre but on the front side where there's more of a focus the pubic triangle is accentuated and the breasts are accentuated quite a lot so that gets us into some of the ideas we were talking about previously with the venus of willendorf now there are quite a few similarities, even though a lot of the style is very different, right? This is what much more geometric, like the shapes here are closer to rectangles and ovals and pyramids, whereas this is more um, sinuous quality to the sculpture and more biomorphic forms, right? But they have a similarity in that the faces aren't very clearly defined, albeit this one would have had painted on, so have been more clearly defined. There's still a very obvious focus on, you know, the breasts and the pubic triangle in both of them. There's a sort of similar quality in the way that the knees are coming down, and there's naturalism in both of them. Um, these have feet that are kind of zigzagging again, so that's a bit of a difference. And this is a much larger, but there were small ones, so that scale scale difference, you know, would be similar in the smaller ones between the two. And they're both in the round. One of the main things is this is much more monumental. Monumental in the sense that even though it's small, it's fully in the round, it has a presence to it that is much... Uh, greater because the whole sculpture is considered on the Venus of Willendorf versus these Cycladic idols have a bit of a frontal focus to them, right? So that that's a that's a huge difference, but there's a lot of similarities and there's thought to be possibly because of that the same sort of idea of fertility goddesses and we talked about this quite a lot in earlier chapter how, and this is a time period that's long ago um, in the prehistoric Aegean as well, there's a lot of similar ideas here um, because life, you know, is not so sure. We don't have, they don't have modern, modern technologies. They don't have modern medicine. And so fertility of your, you know, your animals reproducing, crops growing, all these type of things are, are very important now but they're especially important then in the sense that there isn't a backup plan as much there isn't a wider society that can help out there's no UN coming through and so a lot of these cultures did have um, rites and rituals around fertility and they did worship uh, these type of idols so this is something that you know is pretty plausible um, as an idea here between the two. This one, especially people have talked about being pregnant. There is some idea here that people have said the protrusion on the Cycladic idol would be that way. I don't see that quite as much myself, honestly, but you could say maybe it's there. This one here, you can see it a bit more, but it's not super clear, but there is some idea of that. Um, Art historians talk about that. It's somewhat thought sometimes that they're supposed to be more considered to be like dead people lying in graves because you have them looking up at you and their body is divided in bits by the way the arms. It's like one, two, three, four. 
there's sort of a division in the space, and it's almost as if their arms have been laid across them in burial. Um, and so that, that kind of gets into the idea of these people being part of that funerary ritual and accompanying these are goddesses or idols that accompany people into the afterlife. There's a bit, you know, like I said, mostly I want to just repeat the idea, and I know it's a little bit repetitive though, is that without the language, without the writing, it's we've got challenges as to figuring out what's going on here. So it's some guesswork, but I think we could say pretty clearly that there's what we're talking about with funeral rites and rituals and fertility, life and death, they all sort of go together. And it's pretty clear that we're in the sort of right realm, so to speak, um, when we look at the way the objects are designed and made and sort of compare and contrast them to other civilizations, objects that would have possibly similar function to them. Now, these are the main objects for the Cycladic Society culture and there's evidence that as they declined as a civilization the Minoan civilization began to rise up even more and there's evidence of them moving inland as some of their sites were t overtaken by this Minoan civilization um, so there's interaction between the two and an idea that's presented in your text that this one started to decline and then the Crete the Cretans of now um, the Minoans, based off of Crete, started to increase and take over this area and become the primary force. We could say in general that this would be the most important Aegean culture. And their golden age is circa about uh, 1600 BC. Some archaeologists call this the first great Western civilization, so important culture. And we're going to discuss ideas about their society like I have been already, and their architecture. And then we're going to look to understand visual aspects of their art and, um, and how it influences the Mycenaean civilization. But before we get any deeper into this, it's important to say Minoan, their main script, they did have a writing system, is not deciphered. Um, there's not as much known about them like as compared to Egypt and the Near East because of this. We've talked about this quite a lot. But there are two scripts that have been preserved on clay tablets. Linear A from 2000 BC is not deciphered, but Linear B has been deciphered. It's an adapted Minoan script that was used by the Mycenaeans to write an early form of Greek. And most of what we know from Linear B is admin of goods, so not a ton of cultural knowledge, but we have a bit from that. So it's better off than the like, Cycladic civilization. We're going to look at Sir Arthur Evans. He was a British archaeologist who desired to establish the historic basis of the myths that he loved from Greek culture. So he was trying to find the pre-Greek reality of the Aegean and find the historic actual cultures and we've talked about this already, but we'll get into it in a little more detail here because a lot of the sites that he especially um, excavated were in on the island of Crete. And he started an excavation of Gnosis, which is a major site of the Minoan culture and inhabited since Neolithic times. The culture is called Minoan because of King Minos. This is a depiction of him by William Blake. It's part of an illustration from Dante's Divine Comedy. I want to review our goals here from Minoan culture and art. We're going to discuss the mythology based on it and its architecture and understand the elements and nature of their palace architecture, which is going to be important to myths of the labyrinth and the Minotaur. And then we're going to look at some of the mediums and methods of their imagery. And then later we're going to look at some of their pottery and uh, sculptural forms made out of glass, faience. So, Minos. 
He was a son of Zeus, according to their mythology, king of the gods in the Greek pantheon. He was a son of Zeus and the mortal Europa, and he broke an oath to Poseidon, the god of the sea. He didn't sacrifice the bull from the sea. Um, and Poseidon was the one who made him king. So it was a sign that the people asked for to be king. So as revenge to Minos, he caused his wife to fall in love with a bull. We could think of this maybe in terms of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream as, an ex as a more modern, still really old compared to modern day example of this. And Minos's wife birthed the Minotaur, who was a monstrous creature, part man and part bull. And in their mythology, um, the, there was a yearly sacrifice of seven boys and seven girls as a tribute to King Minos from Athens. Because of his son's death, he went to war and won his, the war. And this was the way that they had to stop the war was to give him a, a tribute every year. And that tribute was basically fed to the Minotaur. So, in their mythology, Theseus kills the Minotaur. And this is kind of getting into what we're talking about, culture of heroes of Athens. So he kills the Minotaur, and there's no longer a tribute needed. And according to the myth, he found his way from the help of the king's daughter and a spool of thread used to mark the path in and out of the labyrinth. This uh, connected to our site in Crete, the Palace of Gnosis. It's thought to be the original that it's based off of. And you can see by looking at it how the actual floor plan of this place, how we could think of it as very much like a labyrinth or a maze that's very complex. Um, this tra The tradition that this palace was King Minos's home, you know, it, it makes sense that this would be connected to the labyrinth and the Minotaur. So what do we know about this place and the historic actualities of it is that it was a home of kings and comfort and wealth and luxury in the city. This is an aerial view of it. It was an important place because the palaces had religious shrines inside of them and there were places of industry and trade and justice. We can say that they had some sort of a system of organized wealth redistribution of agriculture, and they had very, very much um, a lot of luxury items. There was wealth found in terracotta. Terracotta means cooked earth jars. So they're very much a rich and powerful culture. There was a lot of wealth here. And that was an artist's reconstruction of how it probably looked when it was fully standing up and without any problems or issues or age or wear happening to it. This is how it pretty much looks today. This is a bit of an older slide, but you can see how it's been destroyed quite a bit with age. It's been restored a bit, and when we look at some of the images of it, we'll see that there's been restoration work. So the palace was called a labyrinth because the original meaning of labyrinth is house of double axes. And there were a lot of double axes in the decor. And a lot of these places originally had the walls inside of the buildings had frescoes on them, which is a type of wall painting. And we're going to look at some frescoes um, that have been restored and some important frescoes. The double axe was thought to be maybe a cult object, and they were in paintings and reliefs around. This is These columns have been restored, but this is sort of a view of the inside of it. And so we think to ourselves, maybe there was a ritual that they had in this area, religious beliefs about sacrificing bulls, um, and there being sacred animals. Sacred bulls is a figure of speech. That we even use today. The Greek meaning of labyrinth later became a complex maze-like structure. So 
that's sort of the idea we get even in cathedrals in Europe. They have labyrinths on the floor that are maze-like for uh, parishioners to walk through and sort of pray. We can see that, you know, there's not a lot of the buildings left behind. Um, certain parts are just the very foundation. But we can get a pretty accurate idea of the layout of it and that sort of feeling of it being maze-like because we can see where the walls were. But there are some restored frescoes if you go to the site now. And we're going to look at the way they depicted um, figures and how they thought about people and maybe some rituals that they did because of that. You can see that there's like a lot of corridors and you can see how it would be very maze-like. Different levels to these buildings. These pretty interesting pillars that have like a big round capital on them. It's very interesting. And you can see that it has that maze-like off-kilter asymmetrical design. What do I mean by asymmetrical? Well, if you drew a line down it in any direction, it's not mirrored very well on either side. There's some sort of idea of it, but nothing's set in such a way as like a lot of architecture would have something on one side, like a pillar that's exactly alike on the other side. We're looking down, of course, on the floor plane, but still, you can see that they don't have a sort of central axis. There is like a off-kilter asymmetry to it. There's no like one center area like we've seen in Egyptian culture where you're going up the middle of the pylon temple. There's nothing like that. It's all over the place, different rooms for different purposes. It's almost like they added to it over time, but I don't know if there's exactly a lot of evidence of that being the case. It may be that their aesthetic is just different than ours. At least from what I read, that seems to be the case. You'll notice that there aren't a lot of walls around this this palace. It's not a fortified palace, which is interesting because a lot of um, these type of structures in mainland Greece, the Mycenaean culture, they have really big fortified walls around them. So you could ask yourself, why would that be? You know, and think about it for a minute here. If we look at and remember where this is located at. It is an island, right? In the middle of the Aegean. And this is the site right here, Gnosis. There's a natural fortification that comes from it being an island, so they didn't feel the need to have big walls around it, whereas Mycenae has giant cyclopean masonry around it because it's in the middle of the land where people can more easily access it. So. They weren't necessarily a super warlike culture. I'm sure, you know, not compared to at least, we could say, Mycenaeans, which were very much more a warlike culture. So let's keep going on here and look at some of the frescoes. We're going to look at one in particular that has a lot of importance for how we could understand some of these ideas of the bull and sacred maybe rituals and things like that. This is a fresco painting. Um, it has a couple different names. It's come, sometimes called the Torador fresco, also called bull leaping or the leaping bull fresco. It's been restored. You can see how the original pieces are right here. These, these are the original pieces and the part back here has been repainted. So it's not exactly as it it may not be exactly as it was, but we're pretty certain that this is somewhat, based on um, the pieces that we do have, that this is pretty close, especially since the figure's leaping, we have somebody grabbing, and then someone at the back with their hands up. This is pretty close to what it probably would have been like. It's a mural on the wall, um, and this fresco word here, fresco, that means... Uh, painting into wet plaster on a wall in place. So they would layer the wall with wet plaster and smooth it out very nicely. And then they would have to paint quite quickly because the dry time of plaster is pretty quick. They would mix um, the pigments with lime, not the fruit, but the mineral. And once the plaster dries, it is the pigment is permanently bound to the wall, into the plaster. 
it's pretty durable because you can imagine this is from 1500 BC. Um, and we have modern day examples of this. People like Diego Rivera um, used it. And it, especially durable if it's covered and protected from the elements. This idea, this image depicted in this fresco, we think that it was an actual ritual that they used to do and maybe a game. There is an idea in this that this could be a sequence of events like holding the bull's horn, weeping over, and then landing. Um, that's not exactly fully clear. And some people say it is because it's these two figures are the same shade, and this one's different in the middle, so it's like a way of distinguishing the action. I'm prone to think that it's actually more like these are the attendants, and this figure in the middle is doing this leaping activity. Um, based on my reading and thinking about it, especially because the two, the girl grasps the horns and then there's a somersaulting boy in the middle and the second girl is catching the boy. So we know from their stylistic conventions that um, the different tones on the people are boys and girls. They use that quite often. So these are girls are usually light skinned and the men are depicted in a darker skin. So that's why I'm prone to think this is not sequences in an action. But instead, I think this is an actual ritual sport that they had um, where they possibly sacrificed a bull at the end of it. And this is where we get into that sort of Minotaur myth. They sacrificed the bull at the end. Maybe the athletes um, would die at times because of it being so dangerous. And so this is where there's this idea of them possibly being fed to the Minotaur. We have in this sculpture here and in the fresco an interesting stylistic convention. It's called the flying gallop. You can see how the legs are going out here at an angle. And there's a little post having to hold them up because they're in motion. And then the figure is moving. We see it also in the fresco here. It's, see how the bull's legs are not on the ground? There's space. This is meant to give the feeling of speed and movement. It's called a flying gallop. It's got an illusory nature of it. I don't see a ton of speed in myself personally because of it being you know, my modern eye, it looks like a giant bull just kind of sitting there like he's falling down. But that's, to their eye and their aesthetic, that was a sense of speed and motion. The border around it is supposed to simulate colored stones. And it's supposed to be, you can kind of see a little bit of depth right there. It's trying to create as if it's a panel back in space and these are sort of a border around it. It's pretty interesting. So it's almost like a picture within a picture in some way. I kind of, I find this like repetitive pattern to be very interesting. It has like a curvilinear quality and then there's geometric contrast. Um, there's very much a unification of their color palette, right? We have the blues and the oranges, which are complementary colors on the wheel, the color wheel. If you remember back to our introductory lecture, colors that are opposite on the color wheel. It gives this sort of vitality and sense of intensity to the piece. What do we notice about the people and how they're displayed? It's true in the sculptures as well as in the painting. Okay, so you notice that they have a pinched waist and they have curly hair. And there's a lot of movement in the figures in space. Here, obviously, they're flipping over the bull, but it's very, it has a, like a lot of dyn dynamism compared to something like ancient Egypt, which is um, very static and set canon of proportions. See that pinched waist, curly hair, and really a lot of movement. It's interesting to note that the figures have their feet at an angle like standing up on their tiptoes like the cycladic idols there's this feeling of the movement of the planes of the body 
So this must have been an aesthetic that they had a common aesthetic with the Cycladic culture in this way. And it's a way of depicting people. They have, as well as the ancient Egyptians, a frontal eye on the side of the head. So if you can see here, their eye is frontal on a profile, and which is similar to what we've already seen before. But they don't have the twisted perspective or synthesized view. They actually look like they're in, their bodies are pretty much in profile. There's an overlap of the arms and legs to give us a sense of depth of the figure. So there's some commonalities with the ancient Near East, but they definitely have their own conventions. And overall, we could say a lot more movement. Now, as to the subject matter of this, I was, I just kind of briefly accidentally showed you a slide of modern things, modern activities with bulls besides breeding and all that um, for sport. We could think of ourselves when we look at these sort of rituals as being barbaric and totally outdated and why would they do such a thing? But then you have to think about the fact that we have professional bull riding circuits and cowboys, right? We have in in Europe, we have the matadors and this ritual of defying death and slaughtering the bull at the end. There's also the running of the bulls where they let these bulls loose and people run. So there's a long, long, long standing history of of this sort of thing happening all the way back to 1500 BC where there's this sort of idea of the power of a bull. We've talked about this in the ancient Near East with the um, intensity and power of that animal and how they're used to be um, power symbols like the bull capitals in Persia. This is the slide I wanted to show you where you can see the stylistic conventions. So they have these power rituals and we still even have them today. The, the idea of having a powerful animal that you are riding or um, or moving away from and you know slaughtering with your sword a bit by a bit in like with the matadors so this slide shows you clearly this frontal eye on the side of the head and then the curly hair you can see how this is the restored part over here and that's the original and it shows you the pinched waist as well. So I just want to uh, make that even clearer, reiterate that. You can see that it's common in the men and the women that they portray. So still the pinched waist and even the curly hair in the male figures. And there's a lot of dynamic movement in this piece. It happens, this stylistic conventions are not just in this one fresco. They're in all the frescoes throughout the whole palace. So it was a way of depicting the figure that they, this is their style of depicting the figure, just like we talked about with ancient Egyptians having um, their ways of depicting the figure with twisted synthesized view and the canon of proportions. This is their stylistic convention. Very static comparatively. This is Nebuman hunting birds. We still get the we get the frontal eye, but you can see that it's very static comparatively. And you don't ever get motion like this in ancient Egyptian wall painting. Um, and you get this twisting that you don't see here. That's just to illustrate what I'm talking about. This is clear for you guys to understand. I'm going to end this part one lecture here with the Minoan painting and the fresco and how this ties into the mythology. Um, and we're going to pick up on the next one with some of their sculptural objects and also some pottery from this society. And that will lead us into the next um, culture as well, the Mycenaean civilization. So I hope you guys are taking care of yourselves and um, reading your book. You need to stay up on that reading schedule um, so you can understand the lectures better by having the text and this reiteration and additional information. In the next part, we're going to also have some videos of some of these sites, and I'll be linking them on a separate page so you can pause the um, lecture and go to see the videos. Okay, take care, guys. I'll see you in the next lecture.